Kubrick is not a man who started with the great film. Hiroshima, mon amour, à bout de souffle, 400 coups. All these films were first features, and they were remarkable, and many others. The first Visconti, the first Bellocchio, the first Orson Welles, you know, were great. Kubrick, not at all. I mean, if you look at Fear and Desire, you would not say this is going to be a great director. He's a slow starter, but he was very young, and he learned little by little. I think I can find three stages in, in Kubrick's uh, career. The first stage is the very early films, which is really an apprentice work. The second, the films which are highly accomplished, uh, like Path of Glory, The Killing, Lolita. Very good film. But still, even if they are wonderful films and some of the best films of that category, the crime film or the war film, I wouldn't say that they, they are totally different from anything you have seen before. The third stage is really starting with Dr. Strangelove, total revolution, and then every film for me is exemplary of a genre because Kubrick has always worked within the Hollywood genre. He has made a science fiction with 2001, in a way Clockwork Orange, uh, which is a dystopia, but which belongs to the near future. Then there is Barry Lyndon, the historical period film. There is Shining, the horror film, Full Metal Jacket, the war film, and Eyes Wide Shut, which is probably the only film which is not a genre, maybe it's a European art film. It could have been made by Max Ophüls, who loved Schnitzler, and it's an adaptation of Schnitzler, and Ophüls is one of the passions of Kubrick. Kubrick does not follow the principle of the signature. He's more like a painter like Titian or Rubens or Velasquez, that is, he can do paint, portraits, landscapes, still lives, mythological stories, and so on. He, he's not focused on one, on, only on one aspect. People for a long time did not take him as an auteur just because he changes all the time. The way John Ford frames, the way uh, John Ford uses his actors, it's very consistent. In Kubrick, it's, it's very different. Uh, I mean, he would adapt his visual style to the subject matter. But I think maybe Kubrick suggests that there is a unity of his films behind the appearance of total differences. The Kubrick filmography is extremely homogeneous because it reflects his, uh, his temperament. For instance, Barry Lyndon is also, in a way, a remake of Clockwork Orange because it's also a film in two parts. The first part is uh, the ascent of Alex in Clockwork Orange. The second part is the downfall of Alex. Barry Lyndon, the first part, is the ascent of Redmond Barry, and the second part is his fall. It's very interesting, this kind of extraordinary logical framework uh, with uh, like a mirror image of the two parts. Company! Forward! March! Kubrick told me once that he took profit of two things. First, the silent cinema which can be very quick in changing. You don't have to explain. You have one caption and you are 10 years later. So he said, I learned the economy of style from the silent cinema and the same economy of style from uh, commercials. In commercials, you have to tell your message in three minutes. And there is a condensation that he really uh, enjoyed very much. And particularly as a photographer, he liked the idea of capsuling an image, telling something very quickly and very forcefully. To make a long story short, six hours after they met, her ladyship was in love. And once Barry got into her company, he found innumerable occasions to improve his intimacy and was scarcely out of her ladyship's sight. I think that the fact that Kubrick wants to be very precise, almost documentary in his approach, like whether it is science fiction like 2001, he had all the contributions of the best experts in space travel and so on, or in Barry Lyndon, which is set in the past, where he looked at 
thousands of paintings of the time to recapture exactly the clothes, the sets, or the furniture of the time. Comes probably from his first activity, which is photographer and documentary. He made two short documentaries at the beginning of his, of his career, Flying Padre and The Day of the Fight. But that, that does not exclude the visionary. A lot of visionaries have first to put their foot on the ground. They have first to have a kind of stability, like if you fly, you need a good launching pad. So they need this kind of realism and stability for their imagination to work. And after that, you can develop a, a, a narration, you can develop a story and so on. Kubrick has filmed only adaptations of books except the first two ones, and this explains why he stuck to adaptations, because he was extremely dissatisfied with the first two films. He banned the first one, he didn't want anybody to see it, and he did not like very much Killer's Kiss. Uh, and I think uh, the same as we could say that he needs a documentary approach to fly, uh, he needs probably, even if he was a man of great imagination, but the imagination had to come from something that exists already. Eighteenth century, uh, is something very important in the work of Kubrick and in his mind, I think. Remember, for instance, Path of Glory. One part of it takes place in the trenches, which is really barbarism, which is really the, the mud, it's awful and so on. And on the other end, the generals live in an 18th century castle and they dance the walls and so on. Beginning of Lolita, there is a painting, like a Gainsborough painting, and you have James Mason killing uh, Peter Sellers, who is behind the painting, and the bullets go through the painting. The end of 2001 takes place in a Louis XVI uh, bedroom, very much furnished like the pre-revolutionary period. I think the explanation comes to the fundamental um, theme of Kubrick, which is the conflict between passion and reason. It's the key to Kubrick's view of life. Reason is, of course, the 18th century. It's the Enlightenment. It's Voltaire. It's the rationality of Diderot, the Encyclopedia. It's the mechanical duck of Vaucanson. It's a period where science and technology develop highly. So it's a period where people think that humanity has come to an apex. Humanity has come to uh, most, the most refined society, Mozart and, uh, and uh, the great paintings of Boucher and so on. So that's an aspect of it, the rationality. And Kubrick is, as, as we know, fascinated by rationality. He's a very rational director. Uh, he wants everything to be perfect. And yet it's also the century of sensuality, the century of passion, the paintings of Fragonard, the paintings of passionate love stories. It's Laclos, the dangerous liaison. Uh, it's Beaumarchais, the marriage of Figaro. All the psychoanalysis of Freud is to explore the way the passions submerge the intellect. That uh, man is 90% a beast, 10% a Nobel Prize. And that the beast is always lurking there and ready to pounce on you. And nobody is really protected from chaos. So I think that um, Kubrick can be explained by, 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 by this opposition, this very strong 18th century opposition, how a century of rationality can end up in carnage, how a, a brilliant society can end up in savagery. Larry Lyndon, his relationship with the stepson, creates this incredible scene where you have the concert, which is an 18th century piece of civilization with beautiful framing, and then suddenly handheld camera, eruption of the brawl on the floor, people fighting like the apes in 2001, stepfather and son hitting each other, 
So you have the opposition even in cinematographic style because the beautifully composed frame and the handheld camera. But you have that scene again before in the war. They march beautifully well, like all these 18th century battles where everybody goes to the fire in total perfect order. The camera frames these soldiers going in the fields. And then you have the boxing match where suddenly the violence erupts. And in Kubrick, you have very often the symmetric compositions followed or preceded by confusion and chaos. Contrary to a number of formalists like uh, Joseph von Sternberg or Robert Bresson, who are afraid of actors, who, who wants them to, to be dominated and even try to, to annihilate anything that looks like playing, uh, making them puppets or uh, model, as Bresson said, I think that Kubrick was in love with actors. Uh, which is uh, rare in such a formal director who is really so much captivated by style and by photography and by mise en scène and so on. Here's to a long and happy life together. A long, long and, and happy, happy life, life together. And there are two kinds of actors in Kubrick's film. The actors are either totally neutral. If you take Ryan O'Neill in Barry Lyndon, he's very little expressive. Here is my toast here, Captain John Quinn. And then there is the exact opposite, the histrionics, the over the top, which also Kubrick enjoys a lot. It's like the Kuleshov effect. You understand the feeling of the actor from the juxtaposition of the shot before and the shot after. You have really these two opposite tendencies, but never the middle of the road acting in Hollywood style. And I'll tell you what, Mr. Brady, I've been insulted grossly in this house. I ain't at all satisfied with these fair ways of going on. I'm an Englishman, I am, and a man of property. And as for this impudent young swine, he should be horse-whipped. Mr. Quinn can have satisfaction any time he pleases by calling on Redmond Barry, Esquire of Berryville. I think these two type of acting create a distanciation because none of them brings you immediate emotions. I didn't see the boy home. So that in that sense, he refuses the Hollywood uh, formula, which is strictly emotional. But I would defend Kubrick as an emotional director, nevertheless. Because I think when people say that he was cold, that there was coldness in his approach to, to life, I don't agree at all. I think the films of Kubrick have, are highly emotional, but it is a distillation of emotion. The emotion is there lurking, it's present, but you have to to watch for it. And my argument is that Kubrick is always on the side of the victim. He's never on the side of the virility of the character. He's always on the side of the characters who are being beaten. He's on the side of Lady Linden when he puffs on her face. And at the end, she ends in melancholy and so on, totally lost in her castle, all by herself. Now, this goes hand in hand with another aspect of Kubrick, which people have not enough emphasized, is that the fact that he takes sides with the victims is also complemented by the fact that he satirizes the strong people. In Kubrick, the men of power are always stigmatized. The generals in Pass of Glory, the politicians and the generals in Dr. Strangelove, they are being ridiculed. In Barry Lyndon, there is a captain who is looking like a buffoon. Kubrick is an anarchist. He's an anarchist who is against power, whatever religious power, military power, political power. But at the same time, because he's afraid of everything, he's an anarchist who wants stability, whereas normally the anarchist wants the destruction of the state. But Kubrick, it's in his mind. I don't think that uh, Kubrick was as conscious as uh, I may sound about his uh, intentions. And as a Freudian like Kubrick, you must have known, the process of creation is very complex and escapes the artist very often. For instance, Clockwork Orange and Barry Lyndon. I don't know if he saw exactly that there was a repetition. 
I think one of the reasons Kubrick was uh, not so happy with giving interviews is that um, he wanted to protect his creativity, not only to protect his creativity towards the readers that would uh, be uh, somehow bound to his own interpretation. Kubrick said it, so there is no other way of looking at the films because of the word of the master, and he would not like that. He would like his films to be polysemic, to be open to all kinds of interpretations, but also because maybe about himself, not to too much think about his process, to protect his inspiration. I would not cut one shot of Barry Lyndon, not one shot. And Kubrick did not cut one shot of Barry Lyndon, which is interesting because when he showed The Shining, he cut uh, something like uh, 10 minutes in the film, and even after that, 30 minutes in the film. First, uh, the end of the film was cut, and then he cut for the European world version half an hour from 2.30 to two hours. He cut 20 minutes in 2001 after the Washington premiere. But he never touched Barry Lyndon, and he could have because the film was a, a box office flop, which means that he was very lucid about his own work, that he could really easily er eradicate part of a film. It's a film that sums up life from youth to death, from rich to poor. I think Barry Lyndon is exceptional because uh, it's the totality of life represented in three hours.